takes us through a really sketchy neighborhood and like bars and all kinds of other things. And then another time it takes me through this simple route, a different direction. I promise you, and all of the times back and forth, like it was always a different route. But I trusted my GPS and I didn't trust my sense of direction, so I would follow it and we would just laugh and shake our heads like, okay, here we go again on another crazy misadventure. And that's a funny story about a misadventure and my terrible sense of direction. But one of the most intense stories for me uh, was when I was in college. I was a freshman um, in St. Louis, and I was a small town country girl, and I was excited about my big city experiences. And I was talking to a friend of mine that was also a freshman, and we we're like, hey, let's go do our homework at the Arch because how cool is it on a beautiful sunny day to lay on a blanket and to study and to get some sun and you just have this monument above you. It's a really cool idea. And so we get in my little 95 Mazda protege and we drive down there super confident in our abilities until we make the wrong turn and we end up on the Martin Luther King Bridge going over the river into East St. Louis. And I think that what road goes off must then go back on. But that is not the case there, and there was no on-ramp where there was an off-ramp, and so we were very lost in this area, and increasingly more lost with every turn, and we were in a neighborhood, and people were staring at us, and people were following us, and it was starting to get really, really scary. Um, someone tried to park us in on a no outlet road, so I kind of drove through someone's yard um, to get out. And I, I, we're like panicking now, right? Like about to pee your pants, scared. And like our heart's racing. And this is like early cell phone, okay? Like no GPS at this time. Um, sorry guys, yes, I'm not old. Um, but so like we, we had no fail safe and all the people whose numbers we had, because this is early freshman year before you have phone numbers of very many people. Um, and so we could, like nobody was answering their phone and so we're super lost and at this point I'm running stop signs praying that there's a police officer that's going to pull me over to tell me how to get out of there because we're so terrified. And I'm, t I'm telling you, like, cars are following us and, like, people are, like, staring at us. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, what's happening? And so finally we find some sort of a familiar interstate and we're like, just take it west and we'll somehow we will end back where we're supposed to. And we were so shaken and we were so rattled that we skipped dinner and we just went straight to our dorm rooms and, like, had, like, a scared cry um, because we had gotten so lost, because we were so confident that we knew where we were going and that we were following the right direction. And that's kind of what um, 1 John chapter 4 opens talking about, is being so confident that maybe this person is telling you the right direction, like my GPS or like my confidence in my friend that I should not have had confidence in as far as directions go. And we still kind of have like a scared laugh. And I still to this day tell people, if you cross the river, don't exit. Like, just keep going until you get to a very obvious, like, on-ramp, off-ramp. Because um, it can be a scary experience. And sometimes you don't realize how lost you are until you're so lost it's difficult to find your way back. Um, so open up to 1 John chapter 4. If you've got the U version and the app, maybe here's talk about it and you're like, so what? Um, you get the, the Bible app and then there's an events thing and you can go, like, events near me. And that's where you can find Catalyst, and there's some sermon notes and, and the scripture there. Um, but if you brought your brick-and-mortar Bible, 1 John chapter 4, we're going to be in the whole chapter. Um, but something you might notice as we're teaching through 1 John is that it's very cyclical. Uh, you've already heard that it's not written like most letters, and John tends to revisit some of the same things over and over again. And it's not because he's old and senile, okay? It's because he's really wanting these dear people to him to understand what it is that he's telling them about. Um, so he's cycling through these different topics, and there's three main topics that he's cycling through. It's the incarnation of Jesus Christ, um, that they need to have love for one another, um, and that sin in the lives of God's children is not something to be tolerated. So chapter 4, it deals with two of these in particular, the incarnation of Christ and love for others. And when it's talking about the incarnation of Christ, he also talks about false prophets. And he talks about these false prophets and how they were denying the deity of Christ or part of his identity. And they weren't preaching the true Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one. They were altering, or altering Jesus, maybe a lot, maybe a little. Um, but they were also not loving others um, as believers should. 
And as John also talks about love for others, um, he's talking about how in light of and as a result of God's love for us, we need to have love for people. Um, because God showed his love for us through the incarnation of Christ. Um, so let's go ahead and read 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to start with verses 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So my first point tonight is that you need to know Jesus. Like, really know Jesus. And you can't just know Jesus unless you're in his word, right? Because otherwise, you're going to come up with your own ideas and thoughts. And so the best way to know Jesus is to be in his word, right? The best way for me to find my way to the arch would have been to actually look at a map instead of just going on gut instinct, right? The best way for me to find Ozark Christian College would probably be to learn the route instead of constantly relying on my GPS to take me there. So be in God's word and know who Jesus is, the true Jesus. Know the accomplished works of Christ because they are everything. See, we cannot compromise the nature and the identity of Christ, I want to share with you something that I learned from Beth Moore at a conference several years ago that has really stuck with me. And she had all these posters and was telling us this word, Icris. And it's not really a real word. It's just a combination of letters that sounds like a word to help you remember a point. So it's five letters, I-C-R-A-S, hands up. I-C-R-A-S. I promise this is going to be beneficial for you to remember. She had us write the letters on our knuckles so they would be imprinted in our mind. So she was telling us about the identity of Jesus. These five letters stand for something that we need to unflinchingly, uncompromisingly know and believe to be true about Christ. And the first is that he is incarnate. Jesus was fully God and fully human. See, this matters because Jesus can relate to anything in our humanity. And we can be victorious in our temptation because of that. The incarnation of Jesus is something that we cannot compromise on, which John is warning people about in this chapter. He's saying you cannot compromise the incarnation of Christ. Because if you say that he wasn't really God, you, you lose everything here. If you say that he wasn't fully man, you lose everything because that was essential for him to be the replacement sacrifice. C, crucified. Jesus was crucified. Jesus paid for our sin, and we are free from its dominance. R, resurrected. We can have new life through his defeat of death. We can have new life too. A, ascended. See, the Holy Spirit gives us the presence of God and gives us power, gifts, and comfort. Because Jesus left, the Holy Spirit came as a comforter and is with us, and so we don't have to do life alone. And then S, seated. See, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus is firmly established in full authority. Icarus is important because it's the incarnation, the resurrection, the crucifixion, the ascension, and that Jesus is seated. This is the authority, the identity, and the power of Jesus Christ, and we cannot compromise on those things. But see, here's the thing. There's three things that we're tempted to do when it comes to the identity of Jesus. And I kind of think of Peter's denial, you know, when it's like Jesus is going through this trial and Peter's walked with Jesus for a long time and he kind of wants to see what's going to happen because Jesus is his friend, but people start to point out to him like, hey, like, didn't, weren't you one of those that was with Jesus? Like, no, 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 that's not me. And three times he denies Christ. See, there's three things that we're tempted to do when it comes to Jesus. Sometimes we feel like we need to be kind of apologizing for Jesus or maybe fix him up a little bit for people because we want to make Jesus palatable, right? Uh, at the conference I was at, this guy named Eric Epperson says, have you gotten so stuck in your Christian bubble that you forget how crazy the gospel is? So you make it contemporary and relevant. But see, the thing is, the world needs crazy, right? But... Things start to get awkward when you talk about Jesus, right? Most people don't care if you believe in God. 
They don't have a problem with you liking the Bible, but when you start to talk about Jesus, this guy who was fully God, fully man, that died for your sin, that defeated death, and rose back to life again, and that he's ascended to heaven, and then he's coming back for us, that's when most people start to look at you and ask, what kind of juice are you drinking? Right? And so we're tempted to sanitize Jesus so that people don't look at us so funny, or we're tempted to ignore Jesus altogether. It's uncomfortable to talk about Jesus. But I'll tell you something, and I hope this offends some of you. It's more uncomfortable for people to be separated from God for eternity. The third thing, we're tempted to not speak of Jesus. I'm going to confess something to you guys tonight. My heart's grieving through this. I'm having to repent of it, and I'm having to pray through it. Um, Some friends of mine that I met here are not believers. Uh, They're from another faith, and I care for them deeply. Um, And I thought I had a lot of time with them to share the gospel. So my husband and I got to know them, and and we gave them a Bible and tried to love them like Jesus, right? But it's uncomfortable to talk about Jesus, especially because I know that's so different from their faith. And we talked about our kids, and if they had problems with somebody at um, some auto repair place, then we would tell them, like, yeah, no, they're really not being kind to you. You need to do this. Do you need us to help you? And I thought I had all this time. And, you know, I'd I'd invite my friend to church with me to a women's event and and thought I had all this time. And then I find out Tuesday they have to move this morning. Time's up. I didn't have a chance to really talk about Jesus. But see, that's the lie, right? I did have a chance. I just chose not to get awkward about it. Because talking about Jesus can be uncomfortable. Guys, I have to live with that missed opportunity and that they may never come back. And that I could have shared the gospel boldly with them. But I was a coward Instead of being bold, don't do that, guys. Don't apologize for Jesus. If it makes you uncomfortable, okay. Like I said, eternity separated from God is far more uncomfortable than the moment of you saying, hey, I need to talk to you about Jesus because I care more about you than a moment's awkwardness. And I may be a minister, but I get nervous about it too because I don't want to be weird and I don't want to offend But Jesus is worth it. And if I really believe that, then I should be willing to have those conversations. See, we need to know Jesus and we need to speak of Jesus. If you've talked to me for more than a minute, you know that I'm married and I adore my husband. But if I only talk of marriage and I don't talk of my husband, what kind of marriage is that? See, if I claim to be a Christian and I don't talk about Jesus, what kind of Christ follower am I? There's a quote by Spurgeon that I love, and it, I think it's in the app. It says, I cannot imagine a true man saying, I love Christ, but I do not want others to know that I love him, lest they should laugh at me. That is a reason to be laughed at, or rather to be wept over. Afraid of being laughed at? Oh, sir, this is indeed a cowardly fear. Why? Because Jesus is the Icarus the incarnate one, the crucified, resurrected, ascended, and seated one is worth it. Another quote by Spurgeon, and this is one that when I read, it just gives me chills from head to toe. And I hope that it convicts you and encourages you and motivates you as well. It says, look through all the pages of history and put to the noblest men and women who seem to still live this question, who loves Christ? And at once, up from the dark dungeons in cruel racks, there rises the confessor's cry, we love him. And from the fiery stake where they clapped their hands as they were being burned to death, the same answer comes, we love him. If you could walk through the miles of catacombs at Rome, and if the holy dead whose dust lies there could suddenly wake up, they would all shout, we love him. The best and the bravest of men, the noblest and purest of women, have all been in this glorious company. So surely you are not ashamed to come forward and say, put my name down among them. I want to challenge you tonight, though. Do you have questions? Do you have doubts about this Icarus? We want to talk to you. We want to wrestle with you through it because we want you to know Jesus. And if you claim that you know Jesus, and I say this and it convicts me and it grieves me, but can I contain it? Because if I really say that I love Jesus, I shouldn't be able to contain it. I should be more concerned about proclaiming Christ than my reputation with others. Let's continue reading in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. And I'm going to pause momentarily to point a few things out to you because we're walking through the rest of this chapter. 
John opens and he says, beloved. So what he's telling them is well agape What does that mean? Shane, you're obsessed with agape. Yes, I am. Well sacrificially loved. Let us love one another. And it's important, every time that he's using the word love here, he's saying agape, agape, agape. And it's going to sound redundant, so I hope that you can focus on what it is that he's saying here. Let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. Okay, what does that mean? Fancy church word. It's the satisfactory sacrifice. That he was the satisfactory sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, so well agape again. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected or made mature in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected, and this is talking about completely complete, perfectly perfected. By this is love completely complete with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he can see, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this command that we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. So in this text, we see this unarguable statement, God is love, and if you have a relationship with God and he's in you, then you're going to love others. And it should make us pretty uncomfortable because he draws a pretty straight line. He says, you do this or you don't. Like, if you can't love others, then you can't truly love God. And see, Jesus kind of overcame all of the excuses. We might say this person's really hard to love or they seem unlovable. Well, tell them about it. So are you sometimes. So let's talk about agape for a second, because like I said, I'm kind of obsessed with it. Um, And I'm going to talk about another kind of love, too, because we're going to revisit that in a minute. But phileo is like this brotherly, like dearly affectionate love, okay, kind of a camaraderie sort of thing. I mean, it's a powerful, potent kind of love, but then there's this agape, and it is this deep, sacrificial, you don't have to deserve it for me to love you in this way kind of love. And see, our, our love is a response to his love. It's the self-denial, unflinching, persevering, unyielding kind of love. And see, here's this truth. And my kids may one day argue with me, but I love them more than they love me. They cannot possibly love me as much as I love them. I have loved them since before they knew that I existed. I have cared for them from the very moment I knew that they were coming. And I would do absolutely everything and anything for them. I have this kind of love for them that is passionate, and it's jealous, and it's fierce. And God has this love for us, and he's like, hey, like you can love because I love you. See, I hope that my children can see the love I have for them, and that that can be a model and example for them to love others. And I pray that they will love others deeply too because they see the deep love that I have for them. But there's a statement also in this chapter that sometimes I think trips people up. It says God is love. And some of you might go rah, 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 at that point because it's like love, love, love. But here's the thing. God is love. Love is not God. And sometimes we get that confused. Sometimes we think, well, then love is God. And our culture tells us some things that sound eerily familiar to that. And I want to challenge you not to make an idol out of an attribute of God and then miss God entirely. 
God is love. Not that he has it, but he is it. And I want you to hear um, what commentator Guzik says, because I think it explains a little bit more what I mean. By God is love, love is not God. When we say God is love, we are not saying everything about God. Love is an essential aspect of his character and colors every aspect of his nature, but it does not eliminate his holiness, his righteousness, or his perfect justice. Instead, we know the holiness of God is loving, and the righteousness of God is loving, and the justice of God is loving. Everything God does, in one way or another, expresses his love. And let's talk a little bit about this fear thing, that perfect love casts out fear. It doesn't mean that we are not going to, um, that we don't need to have this fear of God, right? Um, there's a difference between terror and dread and reverence for God. You should certainly have a reverential fear of God. But you don't need to have a terror or a dread of God if you are walking in restored relationship with him through the blood of Jesus Christ because you have confidence for the day of judgment because of the shed blood of Jesus. You don't have to go with fear and timidity. You can have boldness and confidence. You can be so confident in his grace and his mercy, so secure in his love, that the arrival of the judge on the judgment day doesn't bring fear because he is your friend and he is your advocate. If you have been forgiven of so much and experienced such love, as John says, how could you not love others? So that's my next point. We talked about knowing Jesus. My next point is love others. There's not an option. You do or you don't. He's telling us do hard things for Jesus. Now, I often hear people say, I love them, I just don't like them. Baloney. I don't see that kind of backdoor exit anywhere in the Bible. Matthew Henry, one of my favorite commentators, says, the objects of divine love should be the object of ours. Shall we refuse to love those whom the eternal God hath loved? We should be admirers of them, of his, and lovers of his love, and consequently lovers of those whom he loves. We had like baby Yoda earlier, and so I wanted to throw out there, this is the way, right? This is the way. If we love God, we have to love others. And that should be our mantra as Christians. This is the way. You say you love God, you must love others. Another guy that spoke at the conference I was at this week, um, his name was Dan Hamill, and he said, love is the currency of the kingdom. This is how we follow Jesus. This is how we show that we know Jesus by loving others. Let's go to John chapter 21 for a second. I want to talk about Peter. In John chapter 21, let's read um, verses 15 through 19. You may be pretty familiar with this passage. Um, This is after um, Jesus has resurrected. It's before his ascension into heaven. Um, For those of you that are in my husband and I's small group, we talked about this last night. We didn't coordinate that. Props to my husband. Um, He just knows me well, I guess. Um, But anyway, so there's this this scene here that's unfolding, and Jesus is appearing to seven disciples. Um, And if you remember, we talked a little bit earlier about Peter's denial of Jesus three times, right? And he was like so adamant, like, no, Lord, I would never, never do that. I would never deny you. And then he did, not once, not twice, but three times. In John 21, verses 15 through 19, when they had finished their breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you, and the word love that he uses here is agape, do you agape me more than these? potentially pointing to the other disciples. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I, and he says, phileo you. I brotherly love you. He doesn't say sacrificially love you like Jesus said. He said to him, Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. He, Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I phileo you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. So he was going to have a pretty tragic death. 
Um, this is, this he said to show what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Okay, so what's going on here? Agape, phileo, agape, phileo, and then Jesus is like, phileo? And he's like, phileo. Um, what, what's happening here? I think, and I had to read a lot of different things, because a lot of commentators say a lot of different things, but I think what fits the context here and what's happening is, I think Jesus is like, will you sacrificially love me? And he's like, I'm like super fond of you. And he's like, will you sacrificially love me? He's like, I'm super fond of you. And he's telling him like, then feed my sheep. And he's like, okay, are you really super fond of me? Because if you're super fond of me, then you're going to take care of these people. And my challenge to you guys is, can you agape if you won't phileo? If you won't brotherly love people, how can you sacrificially love people? You can't say, oh, I'm only going to love people sacrificially. No, you have to brotherly love them too. You have to be fond of them as well. I don't think that Jesus was like lowering the bar there for Peter. I think he's saying like, yeah, I mean, you may not be ready for this agape, you don't think, but start on this brotherly affection path and you'll get there. If the world is crying out for significance, wholeness, healing, purpose, and love, and we have the solution, why do we repackage Jesus and offer them less than the real gospel? See, he's not a supplement. He's the Savior. Spurgeon says, Every man that ever was saved had to come to God, not as a lover of God, but as a sinner, and then believe in God's love to him as a sinner. Jesus loved you when you lived carelessly, when you neglected his word, when the knee was unbent in prayer. He loved you when you were at hell's gate. He loved you when you could not have been worse or further from him than you were. And I'm going to ask if you're going to respond to that and live his love too. Are you going to put skin in the game and love in action, not just in word, but in deed? So I talked about my kids a little earlier and how much I love them and how precious they are to me. If you want to show that you love me, you'll love my kids. But if you say you love me and you care nothing for my children, I will not believe you. Why do we think that's anything different with God? I love you don't really care for them. Well, then you can't really love me. Guzik says, learn to love me whom you cannot see by loving my children whom you can see. So are you going to deny him or are you going to obey him and love him by loving others? Now, maybe you don't have a problem with thinking that other people are worthy of this love, but maybe you struggle to feel like you are loved or worthy of love. And again, to quote Spurgeon, and these quotes are just so rich, so I had to put them in here. To feel God's love is very precious, but to believe it when you do not feel it is the noblest. To choose to believe that you are loved by God, even when you don't feel it. So my challenge, my conclusion, know Jesus, love others. And how do you show that you know Jesus? By loving others, right? And following Jesus' example. So maybe you feel like you don't know Jesus, Come and talk to us. Don't wait. Because like I said earlier with my friends, we don't know how much time there is for things. And I'm not trying to be morbid about stuff, and I'm saying don't put off a conversation that you think you have lots of time for, because it's not worth putting off. Maybe you just need to start loving in action and to quit making excuses and do hard things for Jesus. I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> we can talk about that too. Be kind, love each other sacrificially. The point in this series that we're doing this semester isn't just to give you information, but it's to give you practical challenges and to show you that it's not that hard to do what Scripture says. We want to spur you into action. So as the worship team comes up and we conclude tonight, I just want to challenge you guys to be thinking about how it is that you can love in action. Do you really know Jesus and do you really love others or are you making excuses? Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, um, God, I just want to thank you for the words that you gave John um, to give to these believers and that it is so applicable to us today. Uh, Father, I ask um, that for those that don't know you, um, that they would initiate conversations, that they would respond to the prompting of your spirit, um, that they would start to investigate what a relationship with you looks like. And Father, for those of us that say that we love um, but that we fall short of taking action, God, that you would convict us, that you would make us uncomfortable, and that you would open our eyes to opportunities to really love people the way that you call us to. God, we tend to complicate it. We tend to look for reasons why we don't have to. 
instead of seeking out reasons and ways to love others. God, I thank you for all the people here and the fact that they chose to spend time in community with others, um, worshiping you and, and hearing your word. I know there's a lot of things that are going on in their life, but God, I just thank you that they made that a priority tonight. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray.